Um, I will. I will be more pessimistic than Dan about the future of the transatlantic relationship for the next 10 years. I think that um, uh, all the elements, very true elements you have been uh, uh, presenting us about the economic trends and the investments and all these uh, elements which are uh, proving that the relationship has been essential or is still essential. Uh, maybe missing a point, we are in a, to a crisis which is uh, definitely a time where trends are being broken uh, by the events. And uh, as we know, and we, this morning before you came, we spoke a bit about statistics and statisticians, and uh, we know that they don't necessarily hold any truth about the future. Uh, if I take an example, before 2008, all the economic trends were looking like bright for the future, and then suddenly everything broke into pieces. So I think we, the global crisis we are into is also affecting the transatlantic relationship in a way that, uh, for instance, in the financial field, we have moved in, about, in the last quarters from uh, the traditional, very intense cooperative transatlantic situation into what I will call today uh, almost a war between the financial world of Europe and the financial world of the US. And uh, this is not going to disappear in the, in the coming quarters. This is a long-lasting process. Uh, the pool of money available in the world being shrinking. Both sides of the Atlantic are fighting to try to attract money to their own banks and financial system. So we are now definitively entering a competitive situation which is very new in the transatlantic relation since we know it for, for since uh, 1945. But before getting a bit more on that, I would like to remind us that there have always been a transatlantic relationship, but of very different kinds. Uh, in, after the discovery of America, or or the invasion of America by the Europeans. Uh, there was a colonial relationship. Europe was a colonial power dominating uh, America and North America including. Then there was the 19th century when it was uh, a situation, completely different situation. There was a lot of connection for trade and, uh, and many aspects, but it was like two worlds looking at each other and with nothing really uh, going in between. Then there was the situation of the 20th century, especially after World War II, when uh, the dominance became from the, Ameri from the US on Western Europe uh, after World War II. And I think that we are entering another era of this relationship. Uh, this relationship, the way it was defined after 1945, is, my opinion, completely obsolete now. We have been living the last years of it, in fact, uh, uh, during this decade. Why? Because at this stage, a relationship is not made only of figures, it's made of people, and it's made of institutions. Uh, if we look at what are currently the existing links between the EU and the US, we have three of them. Many of, uh, you have mentioned and developed a lot on one of them, the financial and economic uh, relationship, which is a big one. We have the military one, or the strategic military one, and we have the educational one the flow of students and, 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 and professors uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. If you look at the situation for each of these links right now and in the coming years, uh, they are not necessarily going to be strengthened, these three links. I think they are going to be uh, to weaken very fast if they have not already weakened. It is starting already in the financial sector from partners who are moving into, a competi into competitors right now between the two sides of the Atlantic. Economically speaking, trade is in fact not everything, but let's be clear, uh, the trade powers emerging in the world, they are in Asia, they are not anymore uh, on, the, on both sides of the Atlantic. In terms of education and youth, I will say that we are already far from the, the peak time, which was, I will say, in the 90s, when we had first the natural trend for 40 years of European students to come to American universities. This trend was broken when the Erasmus program started in Europe and that only now 5 to 10% of students from Europe come there when before it was almost 90% of them. And reverse, this trend was broken in the US at the same decade because it was not through higher education but I will say through the posting of military 
uh, of uh, young, young soldiers uh, in Europe that for decades there was a flow of uh, young Americans coming to Europe and having links and connections. This was stopped during the 90s when this flow of soldiers was, uh, was over because of the end of the Cold War. So this education youth relationship, and it was mentioned by the German General Consul uh, during the lunch, I think has already disappeared or is extremely weak. The military one is going to suffer a deep blow in the coming years because of budgetary constraints. On both sides of the Atlantic, NATO included, of course, money will not be where it used to be. So it means that this flow of contact cooperation and so on and so on will have to adapt to a new situation where there will be much less money to, uh, in fact, make this relationship alive. Then we have an apparatus, a machine, the transatlantic machine which makes the whole thing work. It's made of people and it's made of institutions. For decades, it has been a machine based on one single idea, which was a very logical one in 1945. On one side, there was one player. On the other side, there was a lot of players, all those different European states. Uh, this concept is completely over. Even if the system keeps on having this kind of uh, machine at work, the integration of Europe, what we have been talking since yesterday, the emerging of a new sovereign around the Euroland and the Eurozone building will make that during the coming decade, this system will not be accepted by the Europeans anymore. And uh, I will say, you spoke about Americans to have patience with Europe. I will say that in many cases, the Europeans have losing patience about the way the changes in, in the transatlantic uh, islands should be done. And this will be even clearer next year when many uh, leaders of European nations and Euroland nations are going to be changed, we are going to, uh, to see the end of the baby bush generation like Sarkozy and others, and having a completely new kind of leadership coming there. And they will come with a completely different vision of how things should be organized between uh, the two sides of the Atlantic. Then, about the apparatus, the machine, again, it is managed by professionals. There is a professional business of making transatlantic relationship. Uh, uh, some are very good, like that. Others are not so good. But it is a machine with its, its, its bureaucrats, its uh, way of looking at uh, the future of the machine to preserve its existence. And in many ways, like any bureaucratic process, it sometimes loses the rationale for the interest and the long-term vision it needed just for the sake of preserving the tool and the machine. And I think we are getting into this decade to confrontation between the transatlantic machine and the reality and potential, real potential of what Europeans and Americans can do together and want to do together. So I will conclude with a few elements for the next decade, till 2020. First of all, uh, the budgets. For 40 years or 50 years, the transatlantic relationship was based on the fact that essentially America could pay for it. Money was coming from here. Money will not come from here anymore because money will be scarce even here, and especially for these kind of things. So the budgetary constraints are going to be a very important element, which is going to shrink many aspects we know of the relationship. If there is not uh, there are no solutions to find a, a more uh, sustainable and less costly relationship, it will die. The uh, impact will be immediately felt on NATO size. NATO is already facing internal disruptions which are major. I don't want to uh, put emphasis, but just look at Libya and the way Germany has been uh, taking the sides of the BRICS country, Russia, Brazil, uh, China and so on is the UN Security Council. And imagine next year when the French back into NATO will not be anymore led by a pro-Washington president, which in front is kind of strange parenthesis, but are going to be led by most probably a socialist uh, leader with a complete different vision of that. I can tell you, in to NATO, the French are going to be a nightmare very fast uh, from next year on. Then, there will be this call coming from what I call Euroland, certainly in the midst of this decade, by 2015. 
this integration, accelerated integration within Euroland will call for an acceleration also for uh, the defense aspects, just for money reasons, for instance, and budgetary reasons. And they will call for having, for this time, a true one-to-one -one equal partner process of management and decision making into the alliance. If this issue is not addressed, which means it's not already prepared and discussed now, this will be another cause for disruption uh, within uh, the future of the uh, transatlantic relationship. And then there is a global trend. In LEAP, we estimate that by the end of next year, we're going to be seeing a surge of protectionism all over the world. This will also affect the US and Europe. And of course, the relationship, uh, trade relationship between the US and Europe. And in this country, I don't need to make uh, any strong development about that. There are pretty numerous forces which are calling for protectionism as a way to uh, save American jobs and so on and so on. This is also going to be another blow to the uh, relationship. So there we can convert definitely on the fact that the path for tomorrow is going to be difficult on both sides. But I will say that I see more difficulties and, and greater difficulties uh, uh, to overcome in the coming 10 years. And I will be very assertive on that one. Uh, it's not on the US side only that there will be uh, impatience and strong request for the other partner to move and to change. I will just make the last remark on saying that when we look today from European point of view to Washington, we are wondering who we should call to know what exactly will be the policy of the US in many fields. Should we call the president? Should we call the House majority leader? Should we call the Senate leader? This summer showed us that there is also in the Washington now a problem of which telephone call and whom to make. Well, great. Thank you very much.